Hi there, I'm Amy Bishop, a Senior Associate here at DW Fox Tucker. So just a quick question, anyone have a spare $50 million? No? Well, this is what you'll need if you face the new maximum penalty for a variety of breaches of the Australian Consumer Law. And this now includes having unfair contract terms in your standard form contracts. So I think we can all understand that there's a need to have quite high penalties with the likes of Amazon and Google, who at a semi-educated guess are entering over 100,000 contracts a day with consumers. So they need this level of protection and these sorts of penalties to make sure those sorts of companies are doing the right thing. Without the penalties, there just hadn't been much change in the way consumers and small businesses were being dealt with um, since this regime was first introduced and then applied to small businesses from 2016. Um, so it's thought that penalties is going to try to make a real change in consumer protection. Um, the Liberal government originally had some draft amendments before the Senate and these lapsed with the change of government. But Labor has, from the outset, shown enthusiasm for doing a similar thing. And they've now passed new laws to include penalties for unfair contract terms. So although we're talking about the high end a lot, Amazon and Google and places, people like that, um, these new high stakes do make it important for all businesses to be ensuring that their standard terms are fair. Otherwise, you're going to face these quite high penalties. Now, I don't usually start by talking about penalties, but this is a huge change to the unfair contract terms regime, so it seems appropriate today. I do normally like to talk about the law a bit more first and then lead into the penalties. Um, so the new law was called the Treasury Laws Amendment More Competition Better Prices Act 2022. Um, now, before these changes came in, there were no penalties at all for having an unfair contract term in your standard form contracts. If challenged and found to be an unfair term, the particular clause would be vo void and therefore unenforceable. So take the example of a mobile phone plan. If that contained a clause imposing a cancellation fee of, say, double the amount of the plan cost, the consequences would be that the term was void and the mobile provider would receive no cancellation fee. But there'd be no further consequences imposed. Now that these changes are coming through, that same mobile provider, assuming they're a corporation, is going to face significant penalties in addition to the term being void as well. So the sorts of penalties we're looking at are for corporation, there's a maximum of the highest of 50 million, three times the value of the benefit received from the offence, or if that value can't be determined, 30% of the adjusted turnover during the breach turnover period. And so there's a calculation to be done there, but we can see that that's getting quite high, 30% of your turnover. Individuals are going to be facing a maximum of $2.5 million. So these penalty changes are made throughout the Australian consumer law and they represent an increase in penalties that were previously imposed for other consumer law breaches. We're think, think, talking about things like misleading or deceptive conduct or false or misleading representations and unconscionable conduct. These previously had um, penalties in the range of $10 million and 10% of annual turnover. So you can see quite an increase here in the recent changes and even more so for unfair contract terms, which previously had no penalties. Now, with respect to unfair contract terms, businesses have until 9 November this year to review and amend their standard form contracts to be compliant before these penalties are going to apply. Another big change I want to mention with these amendment laws is that there's a change to what will amount to what's called a small business contract. And I'm going to get into this terminology in a little while, but this change essentially means that the scope of contracts to which the unfair contract terms regime will apply has really been broadened. And businesses are really going to have to consider the size of the organisation they're dealing with. Um, 
but essentially it's it's broader. It's going to capture more businesses. I will go into this in a bit more detail in a little while. The regime of protection from unfair contracts terms is contained in the Australian Consumer Law and that's found in Schedule 2 of the Competition and Consumer Act. As you can see on the slide now, this applies to consumer contracts or small business contracts if they're standard form contracts. So I'll explain these terms in a moment as well. For completeness, there are some specific types of contracts and terms that are excluded, so you don't need to comply for the test for fairness with these. These are things like terms that set out the main subject matter of the contract, terms that set out the upfront price payable under the contract, terms that are required or expressly permitted by law, and also documents like constitutions and certain shipping contracts. And there's also a new category, and it's about contracts regarding payment systems, which are used by banks. A further change that has been made gives more guidance on what amounts to a standard form contract. So there's a rebuttable presumption that a contract is a standard form contract. So that's the starting point. That's what people are assuming. But then there's some relevant factors to rebut that assumption. These are things like whether one party has most of the bargaining power relating to the transaction and whether one party has made another contract in the same or substantially similar terms and how many contracts it's made with other people. And this is a new category whether the contract was prepared by one party before discussion relating to the transaction occurred. So was this just a template that someone said, here's what we wanna put to you instead of working out the commercial arrangement first? Then there's whether another party was in effect required to either accept or reject the terms of the contract in the form they were presented. So was it a matter of take it or leave it? And there's also take into account whether another party was given an effective opportunity to negotiate the terms of the contract, or was it just a given that these be entered as they are? And then the last one is whether the terms of the contract take into account the specific characteristics. So this is to cover businesses relying on negotiation of a minor part of a contract or on negotiation of contracts with others or setting out different options for the other party to choose from to demonstrate that they don't have standard form contracts. To me, this indicates a real push to actually have negotiated a contract in order to not be caught up in the regime. So even previously and now, you, stand, you know, your standard terms and conditions that you're giving to people or standard terms and conditions on your website, maybe you're getting people to tick a box, they're all definitely standard contracts. I think with the new changes, um, like as I said, like the template documents that you're giving to customers, if you're not negotiating them and, and you're putting them out there before you've struck a commercial deal, saying these are our normal terms, do you want to have a deal? Then I think they're going to be standard contracts as well now. Um, things that ACCC might be looking at um, is franchise agreements, building contracts, leases, and subscription arrangements. Um, things like Netflix and things like that, the subscription arrangements are quite a hot topic. Um, so if you're doing things like that, just be really even more careful. And we've got the concept. Oh, yeah, um, of a consumer contract. That's quite straightforward. It's a contract for a supply of goods or services or a sale or grant of an interest in land 
to an individual who's acquiring those goods or services wholly or predominantly for personal, domestic, or household use. So that's quite severely limited. Small business contract. So as I said, this definition has really undergone a significant change. So a lot more contracts, small business contracts are going to be for. Um, originally, um, the unfair contract terms only applied to the consumer contract, so like the individuals. Um, and then in 2016, we started applying it to small businesses. Um, and before the changes, that was only going to be businesses with less than 20 persons. Um, provided that the contract price was $300,000, or if you had a 12 month service arrangement, the contract price was a million. So those figures are a lot less. Um, and now we've got if one party is in the course of carrying on a business and they're employing fewer than 100 people instead of 20, and the party's turnover worked out in a particular calculation is less than a 10 million. So you need to be aware of both your thresholds and the party you're dealing with thresholds. I think you can see this is going to cover a lot more contracts. As I was meant to say earlier, part A, that hasn't changed. So it's a small business contract is always going to be supplied with services for a sale or run of the as well. Like I said, the, um, you know, you have to look at the turnover of who you're making the supply to and what employees they might have. It's not always an easy thing to do and maybe it's something you're not in a position to ask them or find out. Um, so the safer course is just going to be not to have unfair terms in any of your standard contracts. So the test for an unfair contract term is if it would cause significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations arising under the contract, and it's not reasonably necessary to protect legitimate interests of the party who'd be advantaged by the term, or it would cause detriment to a party if it were to be applied or relied upon. So if you have a legitimate interest to protect, a term that might otherwise appear unfair in its space might be acceptable. Um, so this and significant imbalance, they're the main things the courts have looked at. The, the requirement to cause detriment or that it will cause detriment um, is quite often assumed. Um, it's also important to note that it's not that it has caused detriment, it's that it would. So if they apply it and it would cause detriment objectively, then um, that part of the test is satisfied. Um, and if you're talking, if you think that you've got legitimate interests, then you need to be really specific if you want to put in a term that could potentially otherwise be unfair. Um, you don't want to draft that widely because legitimate interest is only going to be interpreted narrowly and you have to be quite specific about that. Not like I might want to do something later on. So let's put something in to cover that possible legitimate interest. And then I think we've covered this as well, but the unfair term test doesn't apply to terms that define the same main subject matter, set the upfront price payable, or if it's a term that's required for me to take into account by law. Um, there's also some examples of what might be an unfair term that's actually set out in the law. And this is what people call the grey list. Um, so we've got terms that permit just one party to terminate the contract or vary the terms of the contract, or if one party can penalise the other one for a breach um, or a termination of the contract. Like you might see clauses that say, like, if you breach this contract, you'll have to pay me five hundred dollars. So that's going to be an unfair contract term if it's in a standard form contract. Um, where one party can avoid or limit performance of the contract, so what they're supposed to do under the contract, or if they if you can limit the right to sue. 
Um, but this is quite an important one, particularly for leases. If one party can get to choose whether to renew or not to renew, that's actually on the list of things that will be considered unfair. And another one is if you can restrict evidence that someone can bring in a you know, proceeding in relation to the contract, or if one person gets to interpret the meaning of the contract. So these all sound like fairly obvious, perhaps, except for the renewal one. Um, but I just want to cover a few practical examples so you can see that it's not always so clear. And um, this can help you what to look out for in your own contracts that you're giving to people, or perhaps as a business owner, if you're receiving, you get contracts from suppliers and you want to know what your rights are. So the first one is turn at my budget. So you have, you've probably heard of my budget, quite big in South Australia. Um, and they manage people's um, finances and help them get back on track. And so what my budget will do, and I presumably still do, is that they pull together all of their clients' money and they put them in one account. And then they have virtual accounts for each customer. So they, they can track the balances of each customer, but the actual money is only in one account. And this case was about, uh, there was a few different clauses, but this clause is about treatment of the interest earned on that, on the total amounts, all the clients' funds in the full account. This is what the My Budget term said. Client funds are held in an interest bearing account arranged by My Budget. Interest is not payable to clients of funds held in your My Budget account. Credit interest on clients' funds will be applied by My Budget in its discretion to pay bank fees on the account. And that is what they did. They did use the money, they absorbed it and used it to pay bank fees and things like that, and that they didn't give any of their customers interest. So if we think about the requirements for unfair terms, is there a significant imbalance or a detriment here? And also we need to think about the surrounding circumstances, the fact that they are using it to pay the bank account fees. Um, and whether that's necessary to protect their legitimate interest. Does anyone want to have a go at what the court said? Okay. So it actually was not an unfair term. And that was, I think it's largely because they had legitimate interests, but the court actually found there was no significant imbalance because although the interest was retained, other fees payable were absorbed that we talked about. Um, they found legitimate interests because the costs of accounting for the interest and spreading it out to all those individual people in their virtual accounts, um, it would likely outweigh like what was the small amount that was going to be returned to them. Like a, they brought evidence in court to say it really wasn't going to be a significant, it was only a few dollars each, that sort of thing. Um, and so the arrangement of keeping the interest and absorbing the costs was really reasonable. That was legitimate. And they also said it wasn't a detriment to anyone. It was just a practical way of managing things. The next case I think I'm going to look at is ACCC and Surfboard. So a lot of these cases, um, my budget one's the exception, I guess, but a lot of cases are taken by the ACCC because they want someone to change their contracts going and seek orders, not just about one person, but changing them. Um, so serve court companies provided secretarial IT communication services, and they also um, provided physical and virtual office spaces. And so they had service, um, you know, service supply arrangements with a lot of customers. Um, so there was a big group of serve court companies and they could all use these base terms. So it's a bit of a red flag there. Um, and that's what they used to enter into service contracts with their clients. Um, so the first clause there that imposes an obligation on the client to pay charges for services rendered by Surfport at the rates stipulated by Surfport from time to time. And there's also the second part of that clause is Surfport reserves the right to change, review, or vary the service charges. Basically, they can make up rates and do whatever they want. The next clause um, that gives Serve Court a right to terminate the agreement by giving one month's written notice to the client at any time. 
and there wasn't a correlated cause for the fire. So what do you think about those? They're pretty big, I think. <laughs> they give um, sort of call it unilateral light, right? So um, it can simply decide what the rates are, and it's the only party that gets the right of termination. So that's quite an imbalance there. So the court held that both on their terms. Um, still on the circuit court um, situation. Unless either circuit court gives one month's notice, which is A, or the client gives the required notice, whatever that was in the schedule, in writing to end the um, temporary occupation. So that's to do with the office space that was supplying. Um, so if either of those notices, or unless either of those notices, notices are given before the initial term ending date, then the agreement basically continues for the same period as the initial term. So it's automatic rollover. And then also the service fee for that extra term was also going to be determined by service. So we saw before that determining the fee like that is not okay. So that section at least I think we can say is unfair term. Um, and then the rolling term clause um, that says, like, basically says if the customer doesn't cancel before this certain time, you're automatically resubscribed for the next period. Um, so that's the main thing, I guess, for the focus of fees. And that was also held to be an unfair term. Um, so this, these are generally found to be unfair terms to do the rolling clauses. Um, there was another case, the Crisco Hampers had a similar clause like that, where you signed up and you paid the, like a monthly amount to get your hamper at the end of the year for Christmas. And if you didn't terminate within a certain time, then they signed up for the next year and stuff. Um, that was similarly, that was found to be unfair as well. So you need to be careful about putting those rolling, um, um, renewals in your contracts. Um, I was also going to mention that, like, Serve Court might have had some legitimate interests for some of these, mostly this one, but probably not the other two on the other screen. But um, these were decided by consent orders, so they didn't actually put a case forward about their legitimate interests. They just agreed that, yes, these are all up there, and that's why the entirety of the orders was unfair. Another one is Australian Securities and Investments Commission and Bendigo and Adelaide Bank. So the first clause on the screen provides for there to be an event of default if material provisions of related agreements cease to have effect. And the second clause gives the bank the right to change terms and conditions in its absolute discretion at any time, but as long as it's within the boundaries of the law. So with the first clause, like there seems there could be scope for legitimate interest in that, that if you've got a bundle of agreements, then and some of them fall over, that this one can as well, and that you know that could be a legitimate interest. Um, unfortunately, these were also consent orders, so the bank didn't argue that, and that that's been accepted to be an unfair term. Um, what it does mean, though, is that like going forward, that sets a precedent for other people as well, um, and so. We, Clauses that are similar to this in your standard form contracts are going to be off the base of this case they need to follow, and that will also be of their terms. Um, unless you can really show legitimate interests and you know say that our case is different. Um, just with the previous case that we referred to, so uh, court? Hampers, yeah, to so, yeah, yeah. so, um, say for example, you've got a place that's here in, in Australia, and say a web host type scenario that might be overseas. What happens if they um, have got a reoccurring charge at the end of the 12 months, for example? Would that be still? Under this jurisdiction, it can be. Yeah, so there's different provisions in the consumer law that will bring in 
countries from um, overseas. Most of them have been decided. Um, there were some cases about more about not so much on the unfair contract terms, about misleading, like having misleading statements in their terms and conditions. So some of the overseas um, companies that are directing their sales to Australia um, have got terms and conditions and they say that warranties won't apply and things like that where they do in Australia. And so they've been, um, the court has said, no, we've got jurisdiction over you as well because your terms are here and you're directing them. So there's, yeah. If there are things to satisfy, it's not dear to God like anything, but um, yeah, but we can certainly have done that. Um, I was also just going to go through some other, these just dot points for some more different examples of what could be our fair contract terms. Um, and these have come out just of the AC investigation of the um, chicken meat industry. <coughs> And so the ACCC identified a number of potentially unfair contract terms, and these were all fair. These all seemed fairly. Okay. So they were um, allowing the processes to change the growers' supply arrangements. I think with third parties was the case that they were looking at, and they were imposing additional costs on growers and made like the same sort of thing as the service fees, sort of just able to design. Um, they were able to require growers to make significant capital investments, and there were also imbalanced termination costs. Um, and so, just yeah, so I just thought this was a good example because I can show that it doesn't have to go all the way to court. You can have an ACCC investigation, and this was into an industry, not just one, so one person or one business. And most of the large processes agreed to change all their terms and conditions just off the back of the ACCC investigation. So this gives some idea of what sort of terms would be considered unfair contract terms. Can be a fine line sometimes, um, especially when you're talking about legitimate interests, and it makes us like you can't always tell just by looking at the clause. You might need to delve a bit deeper than that, um, like in my budget case. Um, so if you're on the receiving end of standard form contracts, if you're um, getting them from suppliers from time to time. What can you do? I mean, first, I would say definitely read your contracts, read the standard terms you're signing up to, um, or have the lawyer do it for you. Um, if something seems unfair after you've really read it really well, um, then you can always raise it with the supplier. They might tell you why, or they might recognize it's unfair and they hadn't noticed it themselves. Um, you might be able to change it. Um, can also maybe assist your relationship if you can educate them, you're avoiding penalties for them if someone else brings it up. So, um, yeah, always address it. Um, and I guess most of my focus has been looking at, um, you know, doing your own standard form contracts and what to do with them. And lots of people, they sort of strive to have their terms pretty fair anyway from a reputational perspective. I know a lot of my clients, they just say, I just, what do you think would be fair? What's normal? Let's put that in. Um, so that's good. But with the introduction of the really high penalties, I think there's just a really great incentive to get out your standard form contracts, give them a review, make sure they don't contain any of their contract terms. And you've got until November, but we need those first. <laughs> and uh, so as well, um, the supply chain, so for example, in the chicken processing yeah. industry, what if all the and calls are putting onerous conditions on the processes who are then passing it through to the growers and they took the seed, would they look at the whole supply chain in that connected determination? Because the legitimate interest for one party that could be unfair for another may have been imposed by a third party in a supply chain. Are you know, they effectively yes. passing through? Because, yeah. for example, Coles might specify that the number of chickens has to be X per hectare in terms to be free range. Yes. So they will then say mm -hmm. to the processor, yeah. you know your supply range and so on that you have to have for your capital investment, you need to have larger paddocks for all of these chickens. And yeah. arguably, goes back to the process of who they're selling to. So just yes. curious if you've seen within that realm whole supply chain looked at in terms of the domino effect of passing those off. No, I haven't noticed that particularly, but um, I would think that then the middle person has a legitimate interest in to keep their contract with poles that they need to impose those conditions might be something they could argue. Yeah, and that's what I, um, I would imagine that would have been quite so 
But I think that is, the ACCC are probably going to start at the top. Yeah. If that's where the fairness is stemming from. Just a couple of simple questions. The first one is out of curiosity. You talked about um, effect on the law um, where, where, where the orders were by consent yes. versus by judgment. When it comes to precedent, do they have Excuse equal me. they have equal equality in, in the law? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Because it's actually thing. handed down like a judgment. Yeah, but it, but the judge was never tested by a judge. No. Oh no, it. the judge looks at it because the parties do send orders and the judge makes the orders that they've agreed to. But the judge still um hands down the judgment and goes through um what's the imbalance, what's the detriment, what's the legitimate you know, interest. Like they still go they still go through all those steps of still like a normal judgment. And my second question is really more clarification. You kept, you kept referring to standard form standard contract. contract. Now, what if it is just a contract between two parties, but there is an imbalance, there is detriment, whatever, does that apply, the same law apply to non-standard form contract or only no. to a standard form? Only to a standard form contract, but I guess it's whether you're within that scope or not. So if you're genuinely negotiating and you strike a commercial arrangement with someone and then you say, is your lawyer or my lawyer going to draft this up for us? And one of them drafts it up and then you look at it and it goes back and forth, then it's not a standard contract and they, they don't apply, even if there's a pattern. Maybe that's the next change there. Yeah. In one of the cases you reviewed, the prosecutor was A Triple C, the other it was ASIC. Yes. So they sort of, you know, take turns or is it so whom the complaint is made? Whom the complaint is made, I think. But ASIC um gets tricky. Um so that ASIC only has power over certain things, financial things. I'm not explaining that very well. Um so there's a set. But act. But ASIC, it's not the Australian consumer. So ACCC enforces the Australian consumer law, and ASIC enforces its own act, and that applies to specific like areas. It's in the yeah. court, sorry. No, it's an ASIC act. I think it's called something. It's oh, different again. It's an ASIC, yeah. yeah, and it's got um, like mirror clauses basically to what's and and the um. It's got mirror clauses to what's in the Australian Consumer Law, and the Amendment Act amends both the ASIC one and the Australian Consumer Law. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I think it's more the realm of what it covers. I just can't quite exactly remember what ASIC covers, but it's more in the financial area. I just pose a question that's in relation to the construction industry. Mm -hmm. What's the coal-based industry? What's actually, and generally they use. Australian standard for yes. you, you assume that's already a standard contract. Um, and if the principal gets a lawyer to completely change the contract, should pull the risk to the subcontract. Is that in that is that in itself an argument that it's unfair? So they're still calling it Australian standard for or whatever. And yet in size of zero font somewhere it says, oh, we want it by it. Is that unfair in itself as a principal? Issues doing that, but, um, just making changes to it. Okay. But if it's got unfair terms in it. Well, the second issue is shifting risk. But the subcontractor has no input into it in terms of the design of the Is that unfair? Not quite. Yes, I have a scenario. So you've got a pr the principal that's using the standard contract. Yeah. Is, and what is the subcontract? The subcontract gets so called the same Australian standard contract has been modified completely to push all the risk factors in the head contract to the subcontractor. It's completely unfair in the sense that they've got no say in how the building's going to build. It's determined by the head contract. 
and all the risk, the, the liability, everything in that contract is shifted into some contract. This is happening everywhere at the moment. Okay. Yeah, it's probably more right. like a detriment issue versus a bit of a balance of power. So if the balance of power is in favor of the head contractor and there's a lot of detriment that's being experienced by a subcontractor and they can't have any. Sounds to me like it would be a so, so it's between uh, them. Or more whether it's in a fair contract. Yeah. It's, it's mostly focus on the terms. So you can probably get your date individually. And so if there's two if usually about a contract between the principal and the subcontractor. So if there's a contract between them and they've changed it such that those terms are unfair and there hasn't been able to be negotiation, then the then the rules don't apply. Probably needs testing. Sorry? It would probably need testing, do you think? Oh maybe. Well, I took in my investigate. It's happening a lot in the building industry. Surprise you to see. I've already taken it to the age of the national. And so I think it's slowing down the world. Uh, right. Okay. Let you go about your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.